This is Journeys with Ryan Frank. Conversations about culture and the issues affecting First Nations people in BC. Brought to you by Prince Rupert Port Authority. Linking a world of opportunity. Online, rupertport.com. Good evening. Welcome to Journeys. I'm your host, Ryan Frank, and we're on your nation, your station, CFNR. On tonight's episode of Journeys, I have the Deputy Fire Chief and the Search Manager for Terrorist Search and Rescue, Dave Jepson. Now, he comes on and talks to me about uh, the current situation with uh, the Terrorist SAR team and COVID-19 and and how they're taking precautions. Also, they have a new building that they're trying to, to finish off here in Terrace, so we get an update on the building. Uh, they are going to need a little bit more money here to finish it off. It's all on donations. I think they might get some funding from the government, but most of that funding is supposed to be going towards supplies and training, not towards a building. So they need help to finish off the building. So if you know somebody uh, that can help them with uh, a donation of money, or if you can donate yourself, please do that. Go to their website, terroristsearchandrescue.org, and you can find out all the information there on how you can help them by donating. Also go to their Facebook page if you go to Terrorist Search and rescue uh, hyphen TSAR, uh, or if you just put in Terrace SAR in the search bar, it'll come up as the first response. Go to their Facebook page and you can also reach out to them that way and help them finish off their building because they literally save lives or they can also bring closure to people's lives too if uh, they lose a loved one uh, in tough circumstances. So definitely help them out. And again, I have the utmost respect for these guys. These guys go out there and women go out there to, to help save people. Uh, it's just an unbelievable job they do. So I uh, I really respect that and, and uh, love that there's people like Dave and and his team out there that do this job. So stay tuned. After these messages, I have my conversation with the search manager and deputy fire chief in Terrace, Dave Jepson. Welcome back to Journeys. I'm your host, Ryan Frank, and we're on your nation, your station, CFNR. Okay, here is my conversation with the deputy fire chief and the search manager for the Terrace Search and Rescue, Dave Jepson. All right, uh, Davey J. Is that what, uh, can I call you that, Davey J? I'm not too sure. Is that one of your nicknames? I'm not sure, but... Uh, <laughs> That has been that has been one of my nicknames. Yes, <laughs> Dave, uh, Dave Jepson. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come back on the journeys. I really appreciate. It. How you doing, man? No worries, man. I appreciate it. Uh, everything you guys do over there at CFNR is awesome, and thanks for reaching out and uh, you know to get me back on the show and just talk about things in the community and you know kind of the crazy situation we are in today. Oh man, but you know, I would definitely want to talk about that. But before we get to that, we want to give a big shout out to Debbie, your wife. Uh, you know, she's a fantastic lady, and of course, your daughter Danielle and Kyle and Kobe, uh, your kids. Uh, I know around this time last year, I think you were celebrating a midget championship. So the world's changed a little bit for you, hasn't it? We were, and uh, yes, the our feet were knocked out with this whole situation of course we were on the getting ready to load the hockey bus to head down to do a follow-up uh provincial championship and uh try to go for another gold uh march 14th the bus was leaving town and the, you know as we all know the current situation changed and uh our third year of midgets for our youngest colby uh was came to a screeching halt oh man the prince of persia how's he doing with uh <laughs> well, he's good. Uh, courtesy of Mr. Horgan a couple of weeks ago, he graduated. He's got good grades, and now he has to go work. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kobe, that sucks, buddy. I, uh, I'm a. I it's played time sports. To get a job. Yeah. See, I played sports, Kobe, so I know it was really crappy time for you for sure. But hey, now you get to work. Congratulations, yeah. buddy. <laughs> he's, he's he's in the workforce, so. Oh, that's good. Well, you know, uh, for people that may not know you, I mean, you are, you know, born here in Terrace, raised here. I think you were born down the street from Steve Little, you said last time. Yes, I was. Yeah, at the end of Anderson. Yeah. So, I mean, you've been here, you've grown up here, you've seen the North and, uh, you know, you are part of the search and rescue. I think you're going on, is this your 27th year? Maybe I'm not too sure. Yeah. I'm going to be pushing a little bit more now. I think I'm 28, 29. We got, the. Uh, Got kicked out of Camano there at the end of uh, kind of summer of 1990, 91, and uh, joined up with the team then and 
yeah, it's, I haven't looked back. It's been awesome, and uh, it's it's a great it's a great uh, cause. I guess it's kind of weird to call it a cause. Um, it's, you can't call it a hobby. Yeah. It's a passion, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Might as well call it a passion, and definitely changed my life. You know, earlier you mentioned the big shout out to my wife Debbie. I do have to say it's only because of her that she's let me yeah. <laughs> let me dedicate my my other life to to search and rescue and the community and you know I appreciate that so much from her. Yeah, do like you know because I was thinking about just the job you have to do. I mean, I just I know she must have some pretty uh, tough times for sure. And knowing that you're leaving your bed in the whatever time in the middle of the night and that's got to be stressful on her. So it's always uh, good to give a shout out to Deb. I know uh, she's just an awesome person. I met her. She's a fantastic lady. And and uh, I would expect no less after meeting you, for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. So, okay, so now we, we talked, we kind of alluded to it a bit, how the world's changed here. It's flipped upside down in such a short time because of this COVID-19 and, the, and this pandemic that's spread around the world. And, and you know, yeah. I've, I, I've, at first I was going from, am I overreacting? And then I was going to, am I underreacting? And then I was like, I'm just kind of both at the same time. So it just, you know, this everything is so, so crazy. First of all, I'd like to ask how this has uh, impacted yourself personally and your family. Um, we were thrown right into it, you know, obviously for work, you know, as an emergency services, you know, member, uh, it was on the forefront of everything that we were doing, right? And And, and I'm with you, man. It was like, is it a flu? You know, it's going to pass. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then it just started to it started to take hold. And um, for us, you know, you know, we were like I mentioned, we were in the process of leaving town on March 13th, 14th on the hockey bus, and our daughter and young grandchild Francis and son-in-law Mike, um, they landed in Vancouver on the 14th. Oh man! So it was very evident because. You know, of course, we know March 12th, the province started kicking in on lockdown and, and recommendations of quarantine and isolation. So, you know, firsthand from the family, you know, we experienced that. Uh, the kids were able to stay in Vancouver, you know, you know, for a few days, five, six days, trying to, you know, hibernate and quarantine. And uh, they just realized that, uh, you know, they should come home. We had an opportunity to help one of our friends bring a vehicle home. So they were able to come straight back and they hunkered down in the basement for the next 12, 10, 12 days. And until that, you know, the, the, the 14 days passed and, you know, so as a family we've experienced for sure, um, there's worry. Um, you know, they worry about me and my work, Yeah, obviously, and there's always risk there. Uh, we're starting to see way too many emergency services personnel around the world perish from this disease. Oh, uh, you know, I just just had an email this morning. Uh, you know, we've had a New York, uh, you know, EMS guy pass away, another nurse passed away. Um, it's just a scary thing, and we have to be conscious. And, and I, you know, I, I think people understand, you know, there's this movement at nighttime in the city to thank the healthcare workers and, and I tell you, it just makes me so proud on that. You know, we can't thank them enough. They are the front. Um, they're they're the ones that are stressed about going to work. You know, you know how do they protect themselves? But you know, they're also worried about the families. And, yeah. and that has been a conversation in our house. You know, what happens if you get it because of work? You know, what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to live in the house? Or who has to go outside? Or who has to live where? And um, it is a very serious thing that, uh, has been, you know, put on us, you know, for the, everybody that's not just emergency services to try to work through. Yeah. And man, I just, it's so, like you said, you, you know, you kind of just don't really think about it. And, and then all of a sudden it's like, you, you have to start thinking about this stuff, right? There's no choice anymore. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's very, it's very real for you and your family. A hundred percent. I mean, for every family, it should it be is. on the radar too. Right. Um, for, for- for every for every family, that's right. And you know, from a work perspective, you know the the health and welfare of our staff is obviously paramount. Um, it's the most important thing um, that we have, especially as chief officers or, or or search and rescue executives. You know, what do we do for the safety of our staff? Yeah. Um, ultimately, we don't want anything to happen to any of them. But you know, the underlying 
you know, pull or the underlying stressors, obviously, for us is we, we volunteered for that. You know, we, we decided to go to the front lines. You know, we decided to jump on that fire truck and run into a burning building, you know, put on a gun and run into a robbery, you know, yeah. you know, put on a gown and go into a surgery or, you know, drive the ambulance to save people. So, you know, we know the risk is there. Uh, you know, it's important as management and officers to ensure everybody understands the procedures, uh, proper PPE the whole time. And, you know, there was something come across our wire the other day, you know, in regards to, you know, if you walk into a home and you're all garbed up and you got your gown and your mask and your gloves on, you could instill fear to the subjects of the home you're going to. And, and I kind of read that and a bit of my inside voice here, but I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, who gives a shit? Like <laughs> my priority is, is for our staff. Yeah. I, I can't, I can't, you know, we worry about people's feelings. I get that. But what's important is, is that the emergency services personnel are kept safe. They're kept healthy. They have the right gear and they deal with every situation, unfortunately, as the worst. And I can tell you every single run that the fire department and the ambulance service responds to today, we're treating every single call as COVID-19. Okay, I was, uh, that's what I was going to ask you, because on top of all this other other uh, uh, stressors, I guess you could call it, but just, <laughs> just, just uh, precautions that you're taking when you go into an emergency uh, situation, now you have to add COVID-19 to this situation. So how has that really impacted your team and what precautions are you taking? So, you know, I always wear two hats. I hate to, you know, discussing two hats at the same time, but, you know, fire department, it's very easy, uh, very strict. Um, here's the gear, here's the PPE, M- make sure everybody's certified to wear it. Everybody make sure it's, it's recognized, you know, proper uh, certified gear. Um, we go into every case, we've dialed back our first responders. We've monitored how we approach the subjects. We've monitored how we support the ambulance service. Um, we'll commit one person to that location to confirm what's going on with the subject or subjects. And then based on that information, the, the following team will either gown up or or stay at a minimum level one, we call it, um, type of response. You know, from search and rescue, much harder. Uh, the concern for us, you know, for example, you know, we just had a, a, a crazy rescue the other day where we went and supported the BC Ambulance Service down towards Prince Rupert. Yes. And, you know, we have to think about that. You know, we're, you have three people, four people uh, that have come from all walks of life responding under one identity under search and rescue and then you're jumping in a helicopter um (laughs) he could be looking at us like man are you guys you know infectious and we're looking at him and say man are you infectious (laughs) oh man Um, oh man and then you land you know and you can't be gowned up and masked up in a helicopter and you know you know and then of course we fly under the helicopter and then you land at the subject and it's like okay is this subject contagious um and you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, you have to put safety at the paramount of all of your, your responses, but um, the risk is there. And, um, you know, we've tried to instill as far as response as having masks, having proper, you know, material to clean all of our gear. Um, is, you know, that's on the responses. We're aware of it. There's a lot of work being done from the provincial organization, BC SARA, on how to protect the 2,500 volunteers in British Columbia that respond to calls and, and the different safety measures that they have to have in place. And, and remember from search and rescue, all volunteer. Yes. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and people, pe- people need to keep hearing that. There is not one member in, of any search and rescue organization in British Columbia that is paid or makes money at, by leaving their home uh, to respond to the general public and general call. It is all volunteer. So now on top of the training and all the time to buy gear and donate and raise money, now we got to teach them how to wear a, a surgical mask, yeah, how, to, yeah. how to proper gloves. And, you know, we're fortunate. A lot of our members do come from emergency services side. You know, we worked with deceased people. We deal with bad calls. So, you know, when we roll that over to the search and rescue world, um, we have some adaptability, but... Um, some of our members who don't experience that stuff, 
we do everything we can to try to, you know, keep them at an arm's length from the subject or from the bad situations. Oh, man. You know, I'm just, I'm picturing you guys like on a long line in a helicopter and it blows your mask off and you're like trying to put a mask on or something like that. It's just, <laughs> you just, yeah, you just can't. And, <laughs> And you, you know, your protection is, is you know, hopefully you don't fall. Yeah, right. <laughs> hopefully the helicopter right. doesn't crash. Oh, so man. You, you have to have it all in your gear, and and you keep it tight, and 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 you go from there. Yeah, yeah. man. You know, I just, I again, I want to reiterate about this, the volunteer aspect, because I did last time we talked. I mean, I was I was bringing up myths about SAR and. That was one of the big ones to me. It was I thought for sure SAR was a funded agency where everyone is a paid position, but all these guys and women and men that are doing this job are volunteers. So they have other jobs that they leave to be part of the SAR team. 24-7. You know, and, and we, we mentioned it earlier, you know, to be able to do our job efficiently and, and safely, we must train. Um, that has been a casualty of covid um, I can say, you know, obviously, you know, we can't have our planning meetings, uh, which we have every quarter. You know, we've postponed executive meetings. You know, we've gone, you know, viral. We've kind of gone on the web, you know, trying to do video talks, um, training. We put training on hold for all of our members. Uh, we just can't, you know, to try to follow the social licensing, the social distancing as best as possible. You know, we're trying to alleviate as much in room in one space type activities uh, and you know that's on the training side the calls we just have to respond as safe as possible but training's definitely taken a back seat unfortunately for us and uh, we're very much looking forward to, to this all ending and and us trying to get back not to normal because I think there is no normal. You know, I always say now, I said, welcome to the new normal. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree. This is, this is going to be what it is. And um, the reports that are going to come out from this incident or this situation, the studies that are going to come out, the safety procedures, the best practices, they're going to go in all of our OG books. They're going to go into all of our own procedures on, you know what, this is how you should. This is why you should. And, you know, there is positive to everything. Um it's just, it's sad situations, you know, obviously, you know, we are losing people daily uh, to this awful uh, disease. And, you know, obviously we have to be respectful to all the families that are suffering and all the stressors. And we haven't even started to touch the surface, Ryan, on the, the mental toll yes, that this yes. is taking on, on everybody, the conversations that are happening in people's homes, you know, why are schools closed? You know, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And, the mental toll is uh, it's starting to pile up. And, you know, all we can say is try to exercise, eat healthy, uh, get fresh air and support each other. Yeah, it's so true, Dave. I, I saw some, I've seen lots of, uh, well, obviously a lot of humor and stuff in this aspect, trying to yeah. keep people up. I mean, I've seen a lot <laughs> That's of That's when we normally deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've seen a lot of like Facebook posts or social media posts like, oh, I met the, I'm in, I'm in self-isolation. I met this lady and this kid in my living room. They're pretty nice. I think I'll, I'll keep talking to them. <laughs> Yeah, I've been seeing the same thing. You know that lady that makes us lunch? Yeah, she's not very happy. Yeah, that's your mother. Yeah, yeah. The new norm. The new norm. Yeah. Oh man, it's it's just crazy, man. But uh, when you were talking a bit about um, the SARS uh, SAR team and all that, yeah. what about supplies and stuff? Do you guys have supplies, or do you guys are you guys low on supplies too? Because I've been hearing yeah, a lot of that uh, through the media, right? That, that's been difficult uh, on the SAR side of things. Um, you know, we, we've reached out to different organizations on where we can supply some stuff. Um, interesting policies are made um, and policies are created for groups to follow, but a lot of times that's not followed up with funds, direction, or support. So um, I say that in the sense of uh, Terror Search and Rescue hasn't got a box of N95 masks. Wow. They haven't bought a box of gloves. They haven't bought a but gowns. And so, so who's responsible is that? You know, I'm not going to ever point fingers on stuff. So, you know, to solve the problem, uh, you know, stand up tall and deal with problems. So we've reached out to different groups on, on where we can find some of those masks that protect our own members. Um, gloves and whatnot, you know, we're, we are always supported by 
you know, either the fire department or the ambulance. So in that sense, we are kind of looked after, but uh, it's basic gear that you need uh, to ensure that you're safe. Fortunately, we don't do a lot of calls where we're needing that type of um, PPE. So, um, you know, it will pass and, you know, we're going to experience, you know, whether it be half a dozen, a dozen calls between now and the end, uh, you know, we should be protected or we should be covered for the, the amount of the gear that we do have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good. Uh, now we also talked about your guys' new home here in Terrace, the new SAR building on Greg Avenue. Now I did see, I think you guys had lights turned on in there, all the walls and roof and everything's on there. Can you give me an update on where the building's at? And yeah. also some of the funding, I think that you wanted uh, okay. to talk about as well. It's uh I can tell you it is crazy. Um, it is a phenomenal building. Um, we've been working hard at it for the last two, three years to get us to this stage. And um, it's an awesome stage that we're at. Uh, we're just over $1.1, $1.2 million that has been raised and spent. Um, unfortunately, we are at the end of the road. Um, I do have to say that. Uh, you know, we're not completed. Um, I think another casualty of COVID-19 um, is going to be funding and support um, for our fundraising you know, committee. Um, very difficult. Uh, I don't want to say it's dried up. It's always amazing. You know, you know, there'll be another check in the mail from somebody that they've dropped off. And, 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 and it's awesome, the people that are supporting us. But um, the large funds and the money is just not coming anymore um, for whatever reason. And, and let's just call it a lull. You know, I hope, but uh, and what we're trying to do is use the last bit of money that we have to ensure certain things could get done inside. Uh, we've used, we've sprayed some insulation. Um, Dan from Complete Electric has just been phenomenal getting power to us. You know, I tell you, when we flicked that breaker to give us power, it was awesome. Uh, John Vandervelde, one of our members, is just, you know, always, you know, working to get more boards up and more two by fours and, you know, get to that next phase. And, you know, we, we planned on pouring the last little bit of concrete, the 3,600 square foot of concrete um, at the beginning, kind of, you know, mid-March and another casualty to COVID. Um, oh, yeah. Batch plant, you know, wasn't running. You know, people were nervous having 8, 10 people all pouring concrete. So, unfortunately, it, it was put on hold. So, uh, we you know, we're outside. We're putting building blocks up on the east side of the building where that deck will go for a fire exit and our parking lots. We're, we're trying to keep going, but still also following that social distance. Um, we have a couple of people, you know, that are around that are able to work successfully, still following the best practice. Um, you know, I got to say, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, fundraising. And it's not just about money. Obviously, I love to receive the checks and, and the letters from people that want to donate and and because we just know it goes to such a great cause but um there's people in the community and that also believe and have faith in what we're doing and and see that we're striving for the right reasons and and we're not building we're not just building something we're building we're building a building we're building the community and a and a resource that, that will be into this land for a long time and uh people are seeing that and you know, currently the list is way too long, but you know, I'm sitting here at the yeah. search and rescue hall talking to you down here <laughs> on Clinton. And, um, you know, currently, you know, like you say, Dan from complete electric has just, um, stepped up hundred percent working and doing everything he can to keep our costs down. Um, Tyler and Al Cameron over at Acadia has just been, I don't understand, you know, their support is just so thick. Um, it's phenomenal. They just want huge success for us. Um, I'm looking at four pieces of equipment, you know, from Bear Creek. Um, I've been hauling gravel every morning for the last two weeks in the dump truck, all Bear Creek, you know, here, you want more, what else do you need? Um, we'll give you more. And, and, you know, it's, it's not dollars, it's equipment and, and it's, it's gravel. Uh, it's just, you know, stuff like that, that uh, runs deep in our community. Those are businesses that have been here for a long time. Norco Septic, you know, have stepped up. And, you know, I just left Terrace Steel. And, oh, you're, you know, we need this for the guys putting the sprinkler system in. It's like, okay, do you have a bill? Yeah, no, no bill. Oh, man. Oh, no, you have to give us a bill. No, 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 no bill. 
So it's just, like I say, the list is so long and, and there's just so many people and we are going to thank everybody one day uh, for it. It's just, you know, those are the people that are right now directly making all the difference uh, for this project to keep going. And um, we, we believe we're going to get there. You know, we definitely, you know, we're, we're looking three to 400,000 uh, to get desks on the ground and phones hooked up. But uh, right now, if that's not going to happen, the doors are closed, they open, uh, we can work inside, we can start, you know, tinkering away and using little bits of money here or there to do stuff. And we have faith, we believe it'll happen. And uh, every once in a while, people will hear us on CBC or hear us, you know, hear us on your show, Ryan, and your support is great. And they'll say, you know what, we're going to donate a hundred bucks, you know, we're going to, we're going to donate something. And and that we just ask them to reach out to our Facebook page and, you know, our email address, of course, you know, me through the fire hall and um, a- any donation is appreciated. And just with everything that's going on right now, we know we're not, you know, we don't think that we're the most important out there. You know, we're just a group that are trying to make a difference, but there's lots of groups that are in need right now. And, and we yeah. totally understand that. Yeah, no doubt, uh, Dave. I mean, uh, you know, you're talking about thanking everybody that's been involved. I mean, you know, you thank everybody because you guys save lives. So every time you're saving a life, you're, you're, you're thanking everybody that's, that's put in something into this, any uh, sweat and tears and money. I mean, you're, yeah. you know, you're thanking everybody by doing the job you guys are doing. And, and I, don't, I know thank you's not enough for the job you guys do, but thank you so much for everything you guys do. I just, I can't imagine doing that job. It's just unbelievable. I mean, I watch and my, my son watches uh, Iron Man and uh, Spider-Man <laughs> and Captain America. And I mean, you guys are my heroes, man. I think you guys are amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What? Always appreciated. Yeah, definitely, man. Is there any, uh, so if people do want to donate and stuff like that, where can they go? Uh, what's the information that they can uh, do that? You know, I think uh, what works best is if you just go to Terrace Search and Rescue dash TSAR, uh, our Facebook page, there's links there. Uh, one of the other emails is the Terrace, you know, new Terrace Search and Rescue Hall, uh, a Gmail address. Uh, that that gets hold of us you know we have our search and rescue phone number we are down on greg and and i tell you people and and it's hard right it's like we don't want to push we don't want to force you know i always leave you know people say oh did you talk to this person i'm like no you know we're gonna that and i shouldn't say that one area that we do appreciate people is information if somebody could give us a name that they think that we should contact them we'll, we'll do that we'll pursue that but you know, others, well, you should go and ask this person. Why? Because they have money or they want money. It's like people know where we are. Yeah. People, if they want to donate, they will come and help us donate. And I was here with the other morning, you know, a while ago. And, you know, this little car drives up and he says, here, you know, here's a hundred bucks. I'm like, man, wow, thank you. You know, can we give you a receipt? No. Nope. I said, okay, well, I need your name and your address, right? Because we want to follow up all donations with the card and, and everything. So people will find us. Um, you know, again, you can come down here to, to Clinton and Greg. You can stop at the fire hall. You can contact us through there. You can contact us through, our, like I say, our Facebook page is, is always being updated, and it's awesome. And um, it's just it's just another way. And, and you know what? It may not be, you know, we are getting people that phone, or we can we have a desk or we have this. You know, we're looking for some, some furniture, but not a lot right now. Really, the big push now is, you know, is getting into the building and, and getting it laid out and, uh, moving forward and and again working on finding funds and and how do we fund search and rescue and how do we fund this project yeah no definitely if anybody uh, knows anyone that they should contact please let dave know also uh if you can help them please contact uh, the terrace SAR team and they uh, need your help the, the final push here for the building uh now i know i'm not sure if it was the 32nd or 33rd uh birthday you had in february there so happy belated birthday buddy i i wish i was 30 (laughs) 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 i i I think i i believe i'm 53 (laughs) holy man well you don't look a day over 52 buddy so you look great I, I feel every time I, I land underneath that helicopter, I feel like I'm younger. But, um, 
Yeah, it's awesome. Well, Davey J, I can't uh, tell you how much uh, I appreciate the job you do, and I absolutely just uh, respect you guys so much. And and uh, thank you again for the job you do, and thank you for taking the time to speak with me today, man. I really appreciate it. No worries. Thank you very much. Again, like I say, we appreciate uh, yourself for all that you do and uh, CFNR and their support. It's just uh, it's awesome. Another another great community organization that you're part of. Thank you. And there you have it. That was my conversation with the deputy fire chief and the search manager for terrorist search and rescue, Dave Jepson. Now, again, you heard that they need some funding uh, to finish off the new building they have here in Terrace for the search and rescue team. So if you can help them, please do so. Or if you know somebody that they should contact, Please let them know, as you heard Dave say, go to their website, TerraSearchAndRescue.org. You can find out all the information there to contact them. Also, go to their Facebook page, Terrace Search and Rescue hyphen TSAR. If you just search Terrace Search and Rescue, it'll be the first one that comes up. You can also contact them through Facebook and please help them if you can. They're in the final stretch here to finish their building. We do know COVID-19 has taken up a lot of resources currently. So if uh, you do know somebody that can uh, and is able to, or if you are yourself, please uh, reach out to Terrace Search and Rescue. They literally save lives every day. Uh, they're pretty amazing. They, they go out and put themselves at risk to save other people or to to help bring closure to to families as well. So again, they are all volunteer. Can you believe that? None of them get paid to do those jobs or they go out in a helicopter on a long line, drop into a ravine, help a hiker out or uh, save somebody on the river. You know, it's just, it's it's an unbelievable uh, job that they do. And, and uh, thank you. Like, like I said, thank you is not enough for guys like Dave and his team. Uh, they just, they do such a great job and an amazing job. So thank you, uh, Dave and your entire team for the job that you do. Um, and Debbie, of course, a uh, big shout out to Debbie. That's, uh, Dave's wife for, uh, putting up with Dave. Let's be honest. Hey, Deb. <laughs> well, that, that'll do it for uh, today's show. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Let me know what you thought of today's episode. Hit me up on Facebook, CFNR Network, and leave your comments. Also, go to our website, cfnrfm.ca, and go to the App Store and download the CFNR app. That's it for me today. Until next time, let's see where the journey takes us. This has been Journeys with Ryan Frank. Join us next time for more conversations about culture and the issues affecting First Nations people in B.C. Brought to you by Prince Rupert Port Authority. Linking a world of opportunity. Online, rupertport.com.